Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, today we want to talk about uh, a little bit on hardware security and this is related to the file integrity problem that we talked about. How do you make sure you run a clean version of operating system? Uh, recap, last time we talked about border gateway protocol BGP. BGP if being hijacked, uh, routers will have wrong information and package will be rounded to the wrong destination. Uh, the very important that the, it's to know that you have to balance security with also performance, the decentralized ability of for routers to compute routing table with no central authority. OWASP top 10 ask us to the number one, the top one is preventing injection attacks of, for web applications. Always sanitize your input. Whenever you take inputs from untrusted sources, forms, um, and taking URLs and be careful, make sure you clean it, sanitize it. Uh, we talked about SQL injection prevention, and then later on we mentioned a lot of the PCI professional scanners cannot detect SQL injection vulnerability on our test bed. It's still a, a very much open problem. Um, it's not to say that you should not sanitize your input. You, you, you should always escape uh, making sure that the, the quote, the double quote, single quote are being interpreted correctly, use bind params. But then it is to say that web, if you run a web server, sometimes even the top of the line tools may still miss certain vulnerabilities and, and something to keep in mind of. Um, and we spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, data security standards in the payment card industry. Uh, and then this is just a ties into data breaches um, in target data breach, about card systems, uh, Aquifax data breach, and, and all of these problems. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more after Thanksgiving, um, just a fascinating topics. Um, and so uh, just a little bit, of, you know, wrapping up, up loose ends. Last time we said that routers have ability to compute in a decentralized way the the distance you know the right distance the right route to get to a, a destination even though they don't have a direct hop and so this is a called a distance vector algorithm um, and you can you can compute it distributedly it takes time to converge but then at some point you get a, the optimal solution in this simple example Suppose the source node is E, E want to compute the destination uh, to A, B, C, and D, how long it, it takes. Um, and, and when the algorithm converges, when the distance vector converges, and, and the, the algorithm runs by having routers exchange their routing table. The table will look like this. Um, and, and so, so the, the router will say, hey, let me tell you, I have a new route. Uh, you can get to A uh, through me um, in certain distance. And so they, they send their neighbors, immediate neighbors, this information. And once you get the information um, and you compare, compare notes and, and update table if needed. And so in this table, you have send, uh, source node, the destination node. Um, and then you also have these, it's cost to destination via. You could, you know, E, could get to A directly, in this case, one hop, obviously that's the shortest. Um, you can also get to A via B, which will be very silly when you take a longer route. But then uh, E can get to D, uh, let's see, E can get to C, okay? They don't have a direct connection, but then can get to C via node D. Node D. Um, and in and that's two this uh, two plus two four hops four four um, um, units of costs okay in two hops and and so so this is this is um, uh, the propagation and it's the algorithm it's relatively straightforward you can read a little bit more in this uh, URL link. Um, Vulnerability that we, we last time we talked about the test bed in, in my group, we set up this test bed uh, called buggy cart. Um, buggy cart 
in case you're wondering, has 29 externally detectable vulnerability, and this is uh, all the lists. Um, and the list has 35, if you look at the last row, has 35, and six of them cannot be detected externally, for example, number eight, store CVV in database, and you're not supposed to store CVV, that's why you do online shopping, uh, even if the credit card and ex expiration number uh, year is, are, are stored, that information is stored, it always, it should always ask the CVV because DSS, data security standard says, that information you should not store. Um, but the external scanner cannot scan. A database is always behind the, the firewall, behind the web's applications. So, so when we did the experiment that I explained last time, we only expect the scanners to scan and report 29, but then as we showed, most of them had problem uh, reporting some of, uh, some of the very severe issues. They just couldn't do it. Um, and so a long, long road to go. And, and the, the reason that it's important to be aware of the current practices and the current top of the cream um, solutions and their security ability is that you, you don't have any false illusion. And if you are the security analyst, the system admin, the chief security officer of a company, you shouldn't see, oh, oh, I used, I have my website certified by this commercial tool. I don't have to worry about the, the, the any attacks, it's bulletproof. Now you know it's not that easy. Uh, today I want to spend a little bit of time on TPM um, and hardware provides a root of trust. And, and then we have taught, talked about this again and again, security is indirect. Security is relative. Security requires some root of trust. Hardware is harder to break and providing perfect root of trust. And in, in addition, your hardware technology has isolation capability. If you want to do computation, encryption, signing, those sensitive operation, touching private keys, put it in an isolated environment. And of course, you don't know it's um, why, do, why it is isolation, there's hardware mechanism preventing it. Um, and everything is relative if the hardware is compromised, of, of course, and that, that information uh, could be leaked. Um, and this is related to at the beginning of the semester, we said how should, how can you make sure that your OS is not compromised and your library, your system libraries? And then we said, we, we explained that, you know, maybe you can compute hash, and then, but then we, we talked about the difficulty of storing hashes. You cannot store the clean version of the hash on your own computer, which you are suspecting um, it being compromised. And so you, you, we, we said that, oh, you have to store the hashes somewhere else. And then, but then you have to compute the hash in order to compare with the stored hash. And then that computation could be compromised. And so we said that, oh, you cannot leave your own, your own weight and what, what could we do? And so this is where the hardware root of trust kicks in. Um, the, you can have somewhere else leave to you. Um, and you, know, you assume that somewhere else you can compute hashes in a way that um, it's hard to compromise. So a little bit more motivating scenarios so for using hardware security. Suppose you want to store a key securely and, and suppose your job is to create um, certificates using your private key, you know, your like certificate authority. Um, that private key is your lifeline. If that's lost, then all your certificates are useless and, and then you have to regenerate causing a lot of hassle. Um, so, so how can you store it in a very robust fashion? How can you make sure that a user, um, you know, remote user of your company uh, working from home nowadays during COVID and then they want to connect to your corporate network and then you're afraid that that person's machine is exposed because that person would, you know, is very careless and downloading all kinds of stuff. And so this goes back to the file integrity problem, right? So um, how, can you, how can any machine prove to a system that it is clean? Um, and then sometimes you want to say, oh, I have the software, I want you to 
run it only when you cannot copy, cannot store, cannot you know make copies of my software, and so some sort of a digital rights management type of flavor. And so, so and in general, just how can you ensure a certain state of the machine, right? So, um. And TPM is no longer being popular. Uh, the, probably there are still people who use it. It was a, a very popular like 10, 15 years ago. And there are newer generation that, that re replace it. Uh, but then the concept of TPM is very easy to understand. Um, and so, so we want to explain this. We'll also talk about uh, ARM Trust Zone and Intel SGX. And those are the, the two most hot tech hardware security technologies. Um, and, and so it, at, at some point, this is, was very cheap and very accessible um, in, in a lot of vendors to support this. You do have to enable it, you want to use it. If you look at it, it and it's a small chip, its microprocessor has a, has a computation capability, has, has a storage capability, um, and it can compute uh, encryption, signing, hash, generating random numbers, and so like a crypto pr processor, very useful. Also have persistent memory. This is where the keys that cannot be lost when you restart your machine. So so you'll be persistent, will stay. Uh, it also have um, memory that will be zeroed out when you reset your reboot, when you reset, and so like. A, uh, uh, volatile memory. Um, and so, so in the very important there, they have this a PCR, it's called, a, it stands for Platform Configuration Register right here. Um, so this is, this is a very new concept and the PCRs is for taking a snapshot of the system, is for remembering the state of the machine. Um, and so, so this is this is I would say the most important elements that you need to understand. Um, and all the all those processor, you know, computing random numbers, and you know, that that's not new. Um, and and you can say that okay, you, you have some mechanism to secure storage that also you know like certain air address of the memory cannot be touched. But then. This PCR is a, is a very interesting, it can take snapshots. So, so we want to see how. And so it's just um, registers can store values um, in, in at least 16 of them. Um, it not each value is not very long. It's a, 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 roughly the, the, the value, the size of a hash value. Um, and when the machine starts, what the PCR does is it starts to compute uh, hash values of the system, and you can specify what hash what what system, what part of the system you want to compute the hash of, um, and then the the TPM supported this operation called TPM extend, that would give the hash value into store the hash value into the PCR registers and also concatenating them together, and so you will have a hash chain. Um, and eventually you can have um, one hash value or multiple hash value if you want to separate certain components, computing them separately. You, you can say, okay, the OS and the library com compute hash value separately. But eventually you will be able to have hash values that represent the digest of your system code. Um, and, and, and that's just extremely useful that's taking a snapshot of your system and 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 so you may say okay taking snapshot computing hash of my os is is easy i can i can compute it in command line in my terminal but this is a very special tc or a tc a pcr you cannot modify it once it's computed. You cannot give it arbitrary value, um, and and because it has it has direct kernel access, and so so the, the it will compute it um, in a way that's is very trustworthy, um, and so ensuring the integrity of this compute this hash computation, um, and and so this is this is the. The, the the trick really the trick why TPM does things that we couldn't do for the entire semester, um, and so in in the one 
other element of PCR is that it will reset to zero only when you're rebooting your machine. Um, and so no one can artificially um, modify the value and change it. Uh, but then if you store without the PCR, without TPM, if you store hash value on a file system, say unencrypted, un unencrypted, everyone, you know, compromised machine will be able to, to modify it. But here it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's protected. Um, and so, so, you know, just a little bit more understanding of the, the comparison with and without TPM. And this is a regular boot sequence of a machine. And so there is this read-only memory BIOS, and there are certain uh, type of memory that will always be there. And, and so the, when the machine boots, it's always get there, okay, to see, okay, am I booting from hard drive, from C, uh, CD-ROM from from USB drive, and then and then when you when you start booting the sequence, you have um, uh, a bootloader which is a big a, a small part of the code that will load the operating system, and then the operating system loads itself, and, and then we'll see oh do I have any applications, um, software libraries that I need to load, and so it, so it's a sequence. Um, is a linear sequence and a very almost very predictive predictive. And and with TPM, every time you load, you compute the hash value, and that hash value gets stored into the PCR registers on the TPM. Um, and so so you can check what code gets loaded. Um, and you don't check the direct code, you, you check the hash. And assuming hash values has no collision and so on, um, if the hash value matches the, the version that you expect, then there's no modification to the OS, to the application, and, and so on. So that, that's the basic concept of um, why you can, you can use it. And assuming this hash value is uh, really authentic. Um, and so, so you know, we'll just talk a little bit more in, um, about this. And the TPM, we won't have exercises, so we won't have demos and so on. And uh, but then I want you to understand the con you know conceptual level uh, how how this could be done. Um, and one of the application um, besides you know I would say the the, the simpler application uh, is a, a protected storage. Uh, seal the storage. And so if you have something, you know, like a key, um, some data that you want to be able to access it only when your computer is clean. And so, so you, you like sort of a sealed envelope and you can only, uh, the envelope could, can only be opened if it's the right person. And in this case, it's, if, if, if only the operating system is not compromised, then it can open the envelope and you reveal the, the private key. Um, so the seal, the storage TPM supports, and, and it's easy because you can, you know, everybody can encrypt some secret, right? Mm -hmm. But then the only difficulty is how do you know it's the system state is correct? So you need to have an ability to capture the the system's state, and, and we said that PCR does exactly that. The the uh, platform um, uh, uh, configuration register PCR, right? Um, and and so so what you do is you first set up your keys, and there's a um, whole bunch of keys, and um, because you you have to sign. You have to sign some some inf some information. You have to encrypt and sign it, and so so you generate the keys, um, and then. But the, what's really important is that is this part. This part, PCRs to embed in encrypted blob, and so you're you're creating some sort of a time capsule. You're creating a blob encrypted blob, that blob has your private information that you want to protect. Okay, it could be your credit card number, your diary, your, your, your uh, private key. So, but then the state information is captured as well, is also uh, um, uh, gathered and, and it's captured in PCR registers. Okay, and that is a part of the blob you're gonna encrypt with the, the key, the TPM key, 
okay? And then you, re, you return the encrypted blob. And so, so it's, it's important to see that this encryption is not just encryption of the sensitive data, but also capturing the system state. And of course, whenever you want to unencrypt, uh, decrypt it, unseal the information, you run this operation called TPM unseal. And then one of the, the criteria is the PCR registers at that time of unseal has to be equal to this value in the blob, okay, in the, in the blob. And so only that is the case, then you can unseal. Otherwise, you cannot unseal. The unseal will not work. Um, and in addition, anyone cannot modify PCR value. PCR value is a true, authentic, faithful reflection of your system's state. And so there's no way for you to fold TPM um, and then uh, unseal this uh, blob. So that, that's it. This is protected storage, right? It's pretty cool. And, and of course, the, the enabler is this PCR and, and the assumption that it cannot be artificially uh, tempered with. Um, and so you may wonder, okay, can you artificially temper with PCRs? We'll talk about that uh, later. Um, and, and so software attestation is another big application of, of TPM. And what does it mean? In attestation, like testify, right? So you testify in a court. And so it's, it's to prove something, to say something, prove something. And software attestation means that you prove to a remote party about uh, properties of your software on your system. Right. So you, know, you can software attestation, system attestation. Um, and so you are able to prove it as we, if we know that this snapshot ability, then you are able to prove, right? So you just say, hey, this is the snapshot and this is indeed my snapshot. But then if, if this remote party is outside, you, you, it's not in the same machine, it has to go to the internet. So, so the snapshot value has to be um, read out and send it over on the internet. And, and so you can imagine you use signature encryption, those kind of uh, standard operations to ensure that, uh, ensure authenticity, right? It's really generated from you. you ensure that no one has tampered temper with it. You ensure no one can uh, spoof, uh, can, can uh, learn. And so you encrypt. Um, and so part of it is that you, you want to make sure that the TPR, P, uh, PCR values cannot be artificially tempered with. And so, so it has to be um, sent through TPM to the, to the external party. And, and so I missed this slide. And so this is just to say that there's a whole bunch of keys for different um, operations. Um, and you can generate the keys. There, there's, each TPM has a master key and you can generate an infinite number, a, a lot of uh, smaller, other keys, um, and and so so sort of like um, you associate your identity with your key. Okay? So so your uh, remote server will know this is oh this that's Daphne's TPM generated the key. And so so the PCR you can you can imagine the PCR values generated by that TPM has to be signed by the TPM on chip to make sure that this is indeed coming from that TPM. Uh, and if it's assigned, then no one can tamper with it. Yeah, you can tamper with the PCR value, but then the signature won't match. And, and so this is, uh, we'll, we'll take a look to see how in a little bit more detail how this is done, but conceptually you should be able to understand um, uh, roughly this is uh, how to use the PCR. Um, and so, um, a couple of steps, and this is very similar to this is very similar to TLS, um, and and so the the you know you have this remote party will send you a challenge, and it's, the challenge will uh, just a random number, random nonce to make sure that no one can replay this um, this attestation. Uh, every time it's a new challenge, you have to answer it uh, real time. Um, 
and and so so the the local host the person who is has to prove its machines clean um, will generate a tpm quote and this is again another tpm operation function um, tpm quote is basically sign the pcr value of that machine at that moment and in addition, you also sign the challenge now, so send from, from the uh, remote server to, to indicate this is a, a freshly created TPM quote, okay? It was not yesterday's uh, TPM quote, it was like, created right, right now, um, and, and so to, to prevent replay attack, to indicate the freshness, uh, but then again, the state is is captured here, the state of the machine is captured here. Um, and you want to sign it, um, sign it uh, in, in so that no one can tamper with it. And also you associate your identity with this particular value. Um, and the remote party, assuming knowing the right uh, public key to verify the, this digital signature, in this case, there's no encryption. Um, and, and but so it's a digital signature. You you make sure that this is uh, not um, uh, this is this this hash value um, captured by PCR is indeed coming from that particular machine. Uh, visually, you have this remote on on the right hand. You have remote server. Left hand, you have this employee an employee working from home trying to connect to corporate network. But need to prove that it's it has a clean machine, and so um, get a challenge announce, so create a TPM quote with all the right element, and the, the biggest one is the nonce and also the um, the PCR value that reflect the snapshot of the system. Generate this is certificate, um, and and send it over to um, send it over to um let me see um so so they they you know obtain the certificate and then the pc will send it over to the server okay send it over to a server and and then um and if the server need to prove it's itself um uh, you know um what will also need to do something similar um and then they uh, build it after everybody is authenticated they then create typical um, a communication channel. So, so this is this is a, you know all possible made possible because you have this PCR um, ability of taking a snapshot and uh, assuming that it cannot be tempered with, cannot be artificially modified. Um, and so, so it's and then you know the the hardware protected the encrypted storage where you can only unseal when the machine is uh, trusted in a trusted state. So pretty, pretty powerful and, 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 and it could eliminate a lot of your worries. Um, and needless to say that you know, this slide shows that nothing is absolutely secure. And so that was in like 13 years ago, a group of students from Dartmouth College demonstrated that you can reset PCR to zero so without restarting your machine. Uh, and, and they have some tricks to to connect the pins um, and to ground the pins and, and then you know just um, fooling fooling the 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 chip uh, into re resetting to zero. Um, and so so this doesn't um, it violated the original assumption so so but but then it just shows you that you um, uh, may not have this uh, assumption, although you know this is it has to be very close, like physical attack, right? So you have to the attacker need to grab the TPM computer of the victim, maybe while the the person was asleep, and then be able to do this. Um, so they have they have a YouTube video. Welcome you to take a look. It was the resolution was pretty low because that was thirteen years ago. Um, and so, but hardware enabled isolation for secure execution. And, and so this is last time, you know, previously we talked about secure storage, um, attestation, right? And in recent years, uh, secure execution um, is 
secure execution in a way that are more integrated and uh, into yeah, into the uh, the commercial computer. Right. So uh, in a, like a general purpose secure execution, because TPM what it does is it can only do a handful of operations and all related to crypto operations. Um, it it is not it does not support general. If, if you say okay, can I can I do like check my emails uh, um, in TPM? No, no, you no, you can't. It is very specific pro mic uh, microprocessor for uh, crypto operations. Um, so, so ARM Trust Zone and also Intel SGX are more more general purpose uh, um, hardware hardware security environment that ensure secure execution. And and of course, you know, you probably don't want to like watch uh, uh, streaming videos on on this uh, uh, secure world, the trusted domain, because you know it. it because may not be very powerful in in general, and and so you do you do want to limit your execution in the secure domain, limited to only the, the most important operations, and so in that way the, the size is smaller. The code you run in the secure domain, right? So here secure domain is small, and so you can easily ensure it is secure. You use formal methods, you know, program analysis to make sure it, it is really running secure code. And then here outside, you don't know, you don't trust, and, and but you can monitor. It's very important to know that ARM Trust Zone allow allow trusted world to monitor what's happening here in the non secure domain, but not vice versa. Not vice versa. Okay, the 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 non secure domain cannot access the memory registers of the the, the locked one. Um, and so, so useful application, right? So you can you can do signing um, encryption in a secure world, so that your private key never gets out. And this is similar to TPM as well, uh, but this is again more general purpose. Um, so so, and then you can also monitor. You can monitor what's happening at the the non secure world. Um, and the good thing is that. The non-secure world also it has no idea you are doing it, or had, it, it is is re relatively oblivious of the operation of the trusted world, and so so a benefit of that is if you have malware, botnets, code, virus running on this non-secure world. It will not change its behavior because it has no idea it's being monitored, right? Recall Fred Cohen's 1987 proof. We said that the virus is so special; it knows you're monitoring it, and then it's not infecting anything. Um, and so, so there is a paper called Ninja and that described the using ARM Trust Zone to do this type of monitoring. Um, and an impl implicit assumption is the secure world is secure. And I would say it's a reasonable assumption because, uh, I mean, well, on one hand, you have to assume something is secure, right? Uh, on the other hand, it is um, achievable because you don't hopefully run too much operation, too many operations in the secure world. And so you can, you can secure them carefully very well and you limit the exposure um, you don't download a lot of information you don't surf in a secure world right so um, so um, in, in for example for example there are micro kernels there's like a smaller version of operating system the, the, the really the core operations and then if we, if that's small enough you can use formal methods very sort of time consuming um, check on that, and then you have a lot of people checking on it um, to ensure it's clean. And because once it's clean, everyone in the world can use it. Um, and so it's worthwhile to secure that small amount of code. Um, similar with the TLS libraries, and so TLS libraries uh, is is under a lot of public scrutiny because it's just used everywhere uh, but then and it's a big library but then if you have all the um, brilliant minds examining it examining it and hopefully 
um, the security level quality is pretty high. Um, and so you may wonder what is ARM? Okay, ARM is a, is a company from UK um, and, and ARM is this chip coming from, from the company. Um, and it's important to note the difference between ARM and the Intel x86 chip is ARM is a reduced instruction set is RISC um, as opposed to CISC in Intel x86. Um, six, six, CISC is complex and for complex instruction set. Um, because of the naming, it supports uh, more optimization uh, you know, operations, and and you, you see a lot of uh, and also Intel adds to it all the time new instructions, um, and and therefore be able to support a lot of security functionalities like processor tracing, like logging. Uh, it, SGX is, is uh, like ARM, it's separation, isolation of execution, and then also memory protection. Uh, this is very similar to um, a shadow stack of preventing buffer overrun. Um, and, but then you, know, you, you pay a price, it requires more power, um, and then it's more complicated. It's more complicated, you know, um, and that require you to optimize it better. Um, uh, so it's, it's just faster, um, and and so so you see you see Intel chips always in desktops, uh, servers, and big machines. And ARM is for smaller devices. Uh, Raspberry Pi use ARM uh, drones, um, and, and so you know millions of uh, cell phones, uh, smartphones use ARM, um, and. And so yes, those are the new Intel. In in it, I. I want to I want to share with you in case you don't know is that uh, twenty this is twenty eighteen Turing Awards went to two professors who invented the uh, risk uh, architecture um, and and there was uh, um, Cisco was uh, was uh, um, already existed at that time and then they want to invent it something simpler and that that was was their their invention was a long time ago. Uh, way before smartphones, okay, way before smartphones, and and, and so it was just uh, fantastic to see that architecture was adopted in billions of devices, um, microprocessors, and, and so, um, and then you know I encourage you to take a look at their uh, Turing Award lecture. Um, before we leave, I also want to see, and, and I I will probably mention a little bit more in in. Uh, in the week after Thanksgiving, when we talk about more advanced topics and data breach. Um, Power PC, a lot of you haven't heard of it. It's, it's on Power Macintosh, and this is like 1995, Apple releases Power Macintosh. It was really high-end Mac. It was a pretty big deal uh, back then. And that we that use a risk architecture, Power PC processor is a is a is a similar to risk it's similar it's similar to arm architecture um and then later on they switch to intel um and and so but interestingly it's still used in a lot of military device in military machines military um vehicles including this uh hawk um hawk pave hawk helicopter um and so that was that we and and you just see this slow progression of military CPS system. I mean, you're just way behind the consumer uh, uh, devices. Um, and, and part of it is it takes years and years for, for the DOD to vet a certain architecture in, in the system. And, in the, and so um, F-22 Raptor said it, it was, it wanted to move into Move into Intel processor back in, back in 2001. That was 20 years ago. Uh, but then that particular processor went out of production in 2005, and, and so it was just you know um, uh, 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 many many steps behind. Um, and, and on one hand, it's almost good in the sense that, you know, it's very hard to find a power Macintosh in you know, attackers. Uh, 
probably would have a diff some difficulty testing their exploit. And because current exploit are for a lot of new, relatively modern uh, architecture, modern systems. And so, um, so you, can, you can actually, you would think that you may be able to secure by just being obsolete, but then it's just very disturbing. Um, you don't know how many uh, hackers would have um, the ability to, to put together you know, resources and that, for them to mount those kind of attacks. And so it's very important to secure legacy systems, legacy CPS systems, military systems. Um, so I encourage you to read some of the, the articles. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit more after Thanksgiving about this topic. Um, and so happy Thanksgiving, or early happy Thanksgiving. Also, also, we have this class project update due right after the break is over. So um, do spend a little bit of time um, and, and let me know if you have questions. All right, that's it, thank you.